12 sons. Ten of those sons was by Leah, a wife that he worked for for seven years. And after he worked for Leah, then he got her for wife. She was given to him for wife. And after he became her husband and she became his wife, she gave Jacob several sons, six sons, I believe it was, and then her two handmaidens or two servants, they go to your neighbor say servants, gave Jacob, I think it was four sons together. And so Jacob had ten sons by slaves or by works. But he loved Rachel. And the Bible says that he that Rachel was given to him by Laban to be his wife before he ever worked for her. He didn't work for Rachel to get her as wife. But when she was given to him for wife, then he works because he has her. Amen. There's a lot of difference. Amen. We don't work to get saved. All your efforts never saves you. But we do give ourselves to the Lord for his work because we're saved. Because he lives in us. Because we belong to him. Amen. So when... Rachel was given to Jacob. She was barren. I got to lay just a little groundwork. And because she was barren, all the works of the flesh could not produce a, a, a son. Jacob couldn't make her conceive, and she couldn't conceive in her own efforts. I don't care what they tried. It just, she couldn't conceive because she was barren. So it took God, by supernatural act of the Lord, to give Rachel her child. And that she conceived by a miracle of God, and she conceived and gave birth to Joseph. And Joseph, when he was born, Rachel said that God has seen my affliction, my situation, and he has vindicated me for me being barren and not being able to produce. But then when she named him Joseph, the word Joseph, the name Joseph means adding. So she prophesied that when she got this first son that God was going to give her another son. Well, how did she know that? Because she'd been barren. How, barren, how in the world she knows she's going to have another son? She believed in her heart the same God that gave her the first one was going to give her the second one. So she prophesied by faith that she's going to have the second one. And we know the story real well. I'm, you know, I'm going somewhere. But when she named him Joseph, which means adding, for God shall add another son to me, Rachel said, then we know that later on, God told Jacob to go back to Bethel. And when he got back to Bethel, and there's revelation in everything I'm saying. And if you really, you know, would like the revelation of all of this, then, you know, just read it. And then God will just, you know, he'll open it up. What we do is kind of lay the tracks to run on or the patterns that fit together. And God will lead you into all truth. Because I don't have any more Ability to know the truth than you do. Amen. But what God, the Bible says, the Holy Ghost will lead us into all truth. And if you're hungry to know the truth, then the Lord will lead us into all truth. Isn't that right? The minister is not supposed to give us all the truth. He's supposed to get us on track where that we start seeing by the spirit of revelation and then God fills in the rest. Isn't that right? So later on, after Jacob went back to Bethel, and then after leaving Bethel, which means house of God, after he left Bethel, he was on his way 
to another place, Ephrath, I think it is. And Ephrath, in the Bible, the name of that place, Ephrath, means fruitfulness. So he was going to a place that he would be fruitful. And just before she got Jacob and Rachel and his family got to Ephrath, I'm probably not saying that right, but Rachel had already conceived and she began to bear down in labor and she gave birth to another son. During this time of travail, the travail was so heavy until the Bible says as her soul was leaving her. She said, he is the son of my sorrow. And so I'll name him Ben-Oni, which means that name means son of my sorrow. And she died. But as she died, Jacob stepped in and said, no, even though it's the son of her sorrow, He's going to be the son of my right hand. So that which brought sorrow to Rachel is brought help to Jacob. He will be my right hand. You know, if a right hand, if you're a right-handed person, then you know how important your right hand is. Because your right hand does things for you that you can't do with your left hand. I, you know, I'm a lot better with my right hand than my left one. So what he was actually saying was, is this baby that's born, this son, I'm naming him Benjamin, which means son of my right hand, because he will be my right hand. He's going to do for me what the others sons can't do and if you'll notice now Rachel has given Jacob two sons and these are full blood brothers by the same mother the other ten sons is by three different wives the Bible says that Leah was his wife and she gave him her two handmaidens as wives as wives so that meant that Three wives gave him ten sons. But if you'll notice, they had the same dad, but they have different mothers. We talked about this last week, laying the track. And so in having different mothers, Joseph and Benjamin are really half-brothers to the other ten. They're not whole brothers. They're half-brothers. But Joseph and Benjamin are full blood brothers. Got the same mother. And we talked about these being representative of the old covenant under the law, the ten. And by the way, the number ten in the Bible means law. Commandments, law. So the ten meant under the law, or under works. But Rachel means... The church or the covenant that's not under law, but is under love. And how many know ever since Jesus was born of a virgin, that virgin birth of Jesus meant that he was brothers to the Jews and the, all the descendants of Jacob. He was a brother to them, but actually he was a half-brother. Amen. He was only a half-brother because if you go back, Israel, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, which means prince of God. And God is the one that gave Abraham his son to start with by Sarah that was barren. So who was the actual father of Isaac was it Abraham well Abraham 
could not cause Sarah to conceive, could he? Sarah couldn't conceive. She was barren. So who gave them that son? God did. God and Abraham was totally old and barren. I mean, he was dead, so he didn't have any seed left in him. So who was Isaac's real true father? God. So even though they were the descendants, so to speak, God gave Abraham a seed, so they were called the seed of Abraham. We're still going somewhere. So they were called the seed of Abraham, but God gave Abraham the seed, so they were called the children of God and the children of Abraham, both. Why? Because both of them working together brought forth the nation. All right, let's go back. When Jesus came, born of a virgin, then God, through Jesus Christ, has a new bride now. And we know Jesus Christ, y'all following this? The Bible says that God's first wife was the Jews, but then the Bible says that because they wouldn't produce by love, then now we're the body of Christ, or we're the bride of Christ. Isn't that right? We're the bride of Christ. So where I'm going with this is Joseph, in every part of his life, was a perfect type of Jesus Christ. Uh, we went into that last week, so we won't get back into that. We showed scripture after scripture and, and, and circumstance, situation after situation to show that Joseph was a perfect type of Jesus. He was the natural, and Jesus was the fulfillment of that natural. And we also talked about that after a while, Jesus was the firstborn among what? So when Jesus was actually born and was the son of God, God actually said, I'm going to have some more sons. I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to have a many-membered bodied brother to Jesus Christ. We are Jesus' brothers. Uh, are we? The Bible says so. That he was the firstborn. First of all, he was the only begotten of God. But then Hebrew says he was the firstborn among many brethren. So we are the brother to, G to Jesus Christ. And we're not half brothers to him. We are his, come on, what? Whole brother. The Jews are Jesus' half-brother, so to speak. We are Jesus' whole brother. And when Rachel died, giving birth to Benjamin, she said, he's the son of my sorrow. Now, Rachel represents the church. Isn't that right? Remember the book that the Lord gave me to write? Have you lost your keys about the corn? When a grain of corn is planted in the earth, it comes up and it brings forth. And I went out and saw my dad's crop, you know, and I looked out there and he said, boy, I got a good standing of corn. They wasn't a grain of corn on that, but he called it corn. Isn't that right? But then when the corn grew to maturity and brought forth tassels, then the ears of corn begin to show up in the stalk of corn, with the stalk of corn. Now, the name didn't change. It's still called corn. But then after a while, when the harvest starts coming forth, what happens to the stalk? The stalk starts dying. But when the stalk starts dying... The stalk is actually putting the life of itself into the kernels. Now, the ear of corn is receiving the life from the stalk while the stalk is dying. Amen? And when the stalk dies, then the ear is taken off and peeled, and now for the first time you've got corn like the grain that was planted in the earth. 
For 2,000 years, we have been called Christians. We have been the bride of Christ, or we have been the bride of God, so to speak. Isn't that right? But the church is not just to be the church, which is the wife or the bride of God, but the church is supposed to be bringing forth Christ in our lives. Isn't that right? The church is to produce Christ in us. The church is to receive the Word of God, which is the seed of God, and the seed of God Jesus Christ is the Word of God, and when we receive the Word of God, then we receive the seed of God, and we, even though we're the church, we're supposed to be bringing forth Christ-likeness on the inside of us. Y'all still here? I don't want to get in too much explaining because you can't explain Revelation. We have to see Revelation. And I can get bogged down in explaining. When we can't explain Revelation, we have to see it by the Spirit. And so the church has come to the full. And the reason that things are going on in the church is because the church, the life in the church is dying out. And people recognize that. So what are we going to do? The church is dying out. God never intended for the church to be forever and ever. The church is to reproduce God in our lives. We produce Christ in us. So what is happening is the Christ that is on the inside of us, do we not know that it's Christ in us is our hope of glory? It's not because I go to church and I am the church that gives me hope of glory, but it's him on the inside of us that gives us the hope of glory. Isn't that right? So where are we going with this? When the church starts coming to the fullness when it's time for Christ to be revealed through the church or out of the church or through the church, then it looks like the church is dying out. But the reason the church is dying out and we're saying, my God, what's going on here? It, this is going to be the son of my sorrow. This is going to be the death of me. Look, I'm dying. Can't you see, Brother Ron? I'm dying. Yes. God sees that we're, help me preach, dying. But see, in our spiritual feeling like we're dry and barren and dead on the inside, really and truly what God's wanting you to see is the fact it's not you, but it's Christ in you being formed on the inside. And he wants Christ to be revealed through us to a world out there that needs him. So as we come to the death of church, at the same time, the life of God is on the inside of us in Jesus Christ, and Christ is coming to the fullness on the inside of us. The world don't need another preacher. They don't need somebody just to say, I'm a Christian. The world needs Jesus. And we're waiting for him to come back in the eastern skies when the Bible says when he comes to be glorified on the inside of his saints. So it's not Christ coming back in a, a cloud somewhere like tradition teaches. It's Christ coming in us who are the clouds of witnesses. So it's time as the church the stalk dies that we start realizing, hey, it's not church that's going to keep me alive. You know, some people still go to church to get the church to keep them alive. I have to go to church because the church keeps me alive. It's not the church that should be keeping us alive. It should be the life of God through Christ on the inside of me that's keeping me alive. So therefore, when Benjamin is born... He's called the son of my right hand. We know that jo Jacob in the Bible represents God, the father of the whole nation. So when he did, and Benjamin is born, son of my right hand, then the truth of the matter, saints of God, is Joseph was already in Egypt. He went to Egypt after this and was sold by his brethren, and he was the king over all of Egypt. Isn't that right? So when Jesus came, 
He died on the cross and was risen and has and been raised from the dead. He is the king of this world. We talked about that last week. Is he not the king of this world? But he desired to see his brother, his younger brother, Benjamin. The Bible says in Genesis that his heart yearned for Benjamin. Jesus is yearning for something. He's not just yearning to see his church. He's yearning to see his younger brother birth through his people, through the church. And to bring forth sons of God through us. You say, well, my God, am I the church? Uh, am I the bride or am I a son? Am I a brother? What am I? All of the above. First of all, we must give ourselves to the Lord and be a spouse to him as his bride. And then we give ourselves for him to take his word and plant his word in my spirit. And then when his word is planted on the inside of my spirit, then that word is growing and developing in me as the bride of Christ until the fullness of Christ comes to the maturity in me so that the, what's in me becomes the Son of God. I'm not the Son of God in my flesh, but what's inside of me is becoming the Son of God. Born of God, but yet have to mature and develop. Amen? Isn't God good? Because the neighbor says, by spiritual understanding. Not carnal reasonings. So even though Joseph yearned for his younger brother to see him, the Bible says that when his brethren came before Joseph, who's king over Egypt now, second only to Pharaoh, when he came to him, he recognized his brethren and he recognized Benjamin as being his younger brother. And the Bible says he had to restrain himself. Because he yearned to go and throw his arms around him. And embrace him. And weep and say, this is my brother I've been waiting for for a long time. To come back into fellowship with. But notice, he knew Benjamin. But Benjamin had not yet recognized him as Joseph, his brother. And this recognition did. And so what we're seeing is, Jesus over and over and over, he said, I give my life. It's not my will, but it's the Father's will. Whatever his will is, is the cup that I'm going to drink. What is this cup? The cup that I am to partake of is God's will is above my will. Not my will, but thy will. And so when they were arguing back and forth, and James and John's mother, sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Let's go there to Matthew 20. I feel to read this. We're not going to hold you all day. John, I'm at Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Matthew 20. And verse 20. Matthew 20 and verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What will thou, what you want? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what you ask. Ye, are you able to drink of what? The cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. They said unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, but be baptized and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them, to them, the ghost and neighbor say them, for whom it is prepared of my father. So we see right here that 
James and John's mother came to Jesus and wanted to know if one of their, her sons could sit on his right hand and one on the left. But see, Jesus knew the word. It's astounding to me how little God's people really see any revelation of the word of God. It's appalling. Carnality will never understand the scriptures. It's religion that does that. Jesus read where Joseph had taken his cup and had given it to Benjamin. And Benjamin was to drink of his cup. And Jesus knew what cup that was. And that is Joseph gave up his life and his will in order to become what God wanted him to be. So he gave himself even to be a servant and a slave. And whatever came his way, he didn't fight against it and resist it and get mad and blow up and ask God to deliver him out of it. What he did, he submitted himself to the will of God. And you know what? His brother sold him. Literally said he was dead. And then turned around and he was sold as a slave. But the Bible don't say that he got mad and upset and said, Bless God, I ain't working with nobody. This, I'm, I mean, I'm supposed to be king here. You're not going to put me no servant to nobody. I mean, I'm a child of God. And he, he didn't resist that. He submitted himself. The Bible says that Joseph submitted himself and therefore God was with him. See, death to self means God is with you. We're going somewhere. So therefore, when Joseph didn't fight against things that came his way, but gave himself to God, then let God work out his life, then the Bible says that God promoted Joseph in everything he did. Isn't it amazing how Jesus' life Filled with peace and filled with joy was not because he went around trying to believe the Father to give him what he wanted and to help him accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. He said, of myself, I don't do anything. We talked about the beginning of the, of the, the message today before we turn the tape on. How do we get from stress to rest? It is nothing more than taking our lives and quit trying to get God to do my will and get him to accomplish what I'm trying to get him to do and standing by faith and trying to get God to do this, that, and other. It's taking my life and surrendering to him and say, Lord, here am I. Whatever you want is what I want. And submit ourselves unto God. Let God work it out. Because you know what? The steps of a righteous person is what? Ordered of the Lord. What was Jesus' cup? It was the same cup that Joseph drank out of. What cup is that, Brother Ron? It's baptism. What is baptism? Baptized into death of the self-life and raised in the newness of life so the Spirit of God can flow through. No, I'm not having a battle of preaching. There's a few having a battle of hearing. Because the neighbor said, I got ears to hear. So what is God saying? It's amazing to me how God just blocks some people out and they can't hear. Isn't it amazing? But you know what? I rejoice. I thank God that God hides it from the wise and the prudent and he reveals it unto little old babes like me and you. Isn't that great that God reveals things to us? Uneducated, not smart, don't know. But God just reveals his word. You know what Jesus read about Joseph? And he said, you know what? I drink of the same cup Joseph drinks of. What cup is that, Jesus? I came not to do my will, but whatever the Father says, that's what I'm going to do. Jesus turns right around and he said, you know what? If you save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, for my sake, you're going to save it. So who is it that's going to set at Jesus' right hand. It's the same one that God ordained that said at Joseph's right hand. Who is that? Him that came to do the will of the Father. That came to drink of the cup that God gave him. That is the cup of surrender. We as Christians, we've got to the place like God spoke to me when I was in Alabama about a month ago. He said, my people come to me all the time telling me what all they want me and need me to do for them. He said, but how long has it been since my people came and said, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? 
The title of the message was, What Does God Need? I tell you what God needs. He needs yielded people that he can live in who will accept his baptism of death to the self-life and yield ourselves to him and his will where we say, Not my will, but thy will be done. That's what we want. Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Because when I do that, then guess what he does? He gives me peace. He gives me joy. Well, don't you know what you're going through? I'm telling you. Look what Jesus went through. He was rejected. He was called a devil. He was looked on at religious people kind of crooked-eyed. He was called crazy. Are we willing to suffer and drink the cup that he drank out of? Or are we so consumed with what we look like and what people think about us until we're consumed with that rather than wanting what God wants for our lives? I didn't figure y'all would shout me down, but it's good preaching. What did Paul say in 2 Timothy? He said if we suffer with him, we'll also what? Right. There's no reigning without suffering. What is this suffering? I'm telling you, I've been suffering. The devil been on my case all day, bless his sweet name. That ain't suffering. What is suffering? What is this suffering that he's talking about? What is this cup that he's talking about? The cup that Jesus drank was the fact that he said, Lord, it's your will and not mine. So therefore, the suffering that we do is suffering with him outside of the camp. I count it joy. I rejoice in the fact that I don't fit in with religious people. I don't. They don't like me, and I don't like them. But Jesus said he was constantly trying to minister to people, but their religion had blocked their minds. But you know what? The Bible says he suffered outside of the camp. What does that mean? He was... Given the left foot of fellowship. He was kicked out of the group. He wasn't accepted in the religious people's camps. They persecuted him and talked about him and called him all kind of evil. And you know what? If we suffer with him, he said, you know what? If they call me Beelzebub, then what do they think? What do you think they're going to call you? Oh, you mean to tell me I've got to drink of that cup where people talk about me and run me down and think I'm the devil? Yep. This is his cup. Mm. Well, we've got to read some scriptures here. Whew. Go back to John 12. John 12. I'm on close. I promise you. But I'm not on hurry. John chapter 12. Mm, already done that. Let's see here. I got some scriptures written down here. Oh, Matthew 10. I'm sorry, let's go back to Matthew 10. I've already read or, or related to that. Matthew 10. Matthew, this is important. This is the cup. What cup is he talking about? Do we want to be used of God. How many want God or Jesus Christ living in you to reveal himself through you to a world that is hurting and needing deliverance? All of us. But listen what Jesus tells his disciples. His disciples, just before he was crucified, John 10 and 16. I meant Matthew. Thank you, sir. Matthew 10 and 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as the devil, and harmless as the Holy Spirit. Wise as serpents, and harmless as dove for the carnal mind. Serpent is the devil. Dove is the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> Just teasing. Verse 17. But beware of men... For they will deliver you up to the council and they will scourge you in their synagogues and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. 
But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that self-same hour what you should speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of God which what? That speaks where? In you. Not to you, but in you. If we have the Spirit of Christ on the inside of us, when we get into situations, if we will not try to figure out what we're going to say and how we're going to do it, but wait and let the Spirit of God give us what to say, He will give us in that self-same moment a word of wisdom just like that to say, to know what to say at that right time. Isn't that right? This is what it says in verse 20. For it is not ye that speaketh, but the Father that speaketh in you. Verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of what? Of all men for what? My name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye unto another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, neither the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house, Beelzebub, or the prince of flies, or the devil, how much more shall they call them of his household? So he's telling us right here, the cup that we are to drink of him is the same cup that he drank of. When you're born of God, when you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and when you believe the word of God, then what you will be, you will be persecuted. Keep smiling. The Bible says when they persecute you and, and talk about you and cast your name out as evil and do all these things against you, what did he say to do? Rejoice with exceeding great joy because you know that they did the same thing to him. So when, they, when we start drinking of the cup of suffering, when we start drinking of the cup of rejection, when we start drinking of the cup that people give us a persecution, what we do is smile and look at them and say, Thank God. God is in me for a surety. Are you in me hating me like you do? Praise God. <laughs> well, I don't want like for people to talk against me. Hurts my feelings. Drink the cup. <laughs> Go ahead, drink the cup. Because are you able to drink the cup that he drank of? See, we all want to be like Jesus. But we want everybody to love us and just cherry us and pat us on the back and tell, pat us on the head and tell us what good little kids we are. I know you're a child of God. I just see it all over you. We pastored in Birmingham. Guy came to over to my father-in-law's house. Been an alcoholic for years. Done everything to quit and couldn't. Hermie was talking to him. My father-in-law was talking to him about how the Lord delivers and sets people free. He said, I got a son-in-law. Lives right down the road here. He said, he was on drugs. His life was in a mess. He said, man, he said, I'm telling you, he said, God changed that man's life. Set him free said he ain't never took drugs no more, don't even want them. He said, the same God that delivered my son-in-law will deliver you if you want to be delivered. He said, I want to be delivered. He said, well, can you wait till I call my son-in-law? And so he called us, and we went down there, and I just began to give him a testimony how the Lord delivered me. I mean, no, I can't deliver nobody. Come on. But when I talk and tell him and point him to where Jesus, Jesus can, heal, uh, can deliver anybody. To make a long story short, we was talking to him a little bit. He broke down and started crying. We laid hands on him, cast that alcohol demon out of him that, caught, that had him captured and he couldn't get free, and God set him free. I'm talking about standing in the yard and him a-bawling and a-crying and me bawling and a-crying, my daddy-law bawling and crying. The Lord set that man free just like that. Changed his life. And he came to church that very weekend and got up and shared with the people how he hadn't even wanted a drink. Boy, he just glowing all over his face. 
The next week, I went back down to my father-in-law's house. And I was out in the yard cutting the grass, and his wife came across the street. Man, I mean, she is coming over there. She, I cut the lawnmower off, and I said, yes. I said, how you doing? I ain't doing good. I said, well, what's going on? She said, I don't know what you've done to my husband, but she said, he ain't the same man. I want my old husband back. I said, you mean to tell me that him being an alcoholic, staying drunk, you'd rather have that husband than the one you got now? Yeah. I said, well, why? She said, because I don't know that man. That ain't the man I married. And after a while, she just looked at me right now. She said, you know what? I don't have a clue why I hate you. She said, when I came over here, she said, I just got mad. She said, I just hate you, man. I looked at her, smiled. I said, you know what? It ain't you that hates me. I said, it's that devil that lives in you that hates me. I said, you know what? The Christ in me, that devil in you, knows that Christ is in me. I said, that's what rose up. You don't even know me. How could you hate me? I hadn't done anything to you. I said, spirits is warning against spirits right now. You call me a devil? I said, no, you're not the devil. He's just in you. And he's making you feel that way. <laughs> See, it, would, it shouldn't surprise us, brother, for somebody to come up to me and say, I don't know what it is about you. I just can't stand you. And when you're around them, they always just cross ways with you. Isn't it amazing when you're around some people, they just, I mean, you just irritate the steam out of them. You ain't done nothing to them. They just don't like you. I didn't like him the first time I ever seen him. Praise God. <laughs> I'm glad. Because you know what that does to me? It don't make me feel bad at all. I just know where that's coming from. And it ain't you. I mean, it ain't the person. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about them other, you know. I'm talking about them that just grind on you, know, and just irritate you, can't stand to be around you. I know where that comes from. Jesus said, if they hated me without a call, now, I'm not talking about if you've done something to upset people, then go to them and ask them to forgive you and get it straight. Amen? But if I hate you without a cause, they hated me without a cause. But you know what we want? We want, when we drink of his cup of the Spirit, we want people to love us without a cause. But no man is above his master. If they've hated me, if they hated him, they're going to hate you. A foot. I ain't going to get around that bunch if everybody hates. That's the ones I want to go join. <laughs> Why? Count it all joy when they cast your name out as evil and they speak all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. Amen? Let me hurry. No, I'm not going to hurry. But let me finish. When we Take our lives that is stressing us out to the max. We're doing our best to get God. I don't understand God. I have prayed about this ten times, and you ain't answered this yet. I, my faith, God, I've been holding on for you to change this or change that or change this person or get, get them to do right and all this kind of stuff, and, and we're frustrated and upset, and, and, and you know, now we're upset at God because God won't change it. God said, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. What did Joseph say to Benjamin and his brothers? The one who's got the silver cup, he will be my servant. Not all the rest of y'all, but the one with the cup will be my servant. But you know what we've done? We've turned around and made Joseph our servant. I mean, you know, we know people like that, don't we? It's all about going to Jesus, which Joseph was a type and getting Jesus to help me with my life and what I want and how I want it. And I want him to fix everything that I want him to fix. I don't read in the scriptures 
or that I'm God and he's my servant. I knew I punctured a bunch of balloons right then. That's not what it's about. If we surrender ourselves to him and let him have our life. 1999, I'm hurrying with this. I mean, I ain't hurrying either, I'm finishing. 1999, our life was in such a vice, pressure from every side. Didn't know how in the world nothing was ever going to work out. God had me in his vice, and he was waiting for me to throw up my hands and how I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all. Lord, if they come and they hook up to this mobile home and pull it off of the lot, I'm still your child. I'm not fighting to keep it any longer. Uh-oh. If they come and take the van, carry it off, I'm not going to fight to try to hold on to it and believe you're going to pay the payment and believe you're going to help pull it out. No, and they believe you're going for this and I'm believing you for that. I said, no, God, if they come, me and Barbara, Barbara and I both, we sat in that living room and finally that pressure broke us so we would surrender our life to him and say, all right, God, this is it. If they come and haul it all off and we have nothing left, it doesn't matter anymore. What we want is for your will to be done in our lives. It don't matter no more. Now, that's not a no-care attitude. That's a surrender attitude. No-care attitude. I don't give a flip what to No, You ain't ripe yet. That won't get it. But it's when you take your heart and say, God, I surrender all of it to you. What you do with my life is up to you. What does he tell us in Proverbs 3, 5? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. But we're so trying to get directing God in the path that we want him to go. That's not the cup. The cup is a cup of surrender. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's what the Lord spoke to him in Alabama. He said, I've got so many things that I am wanting and desiring to do in the earth. But he said, I don't have a body that's yielded to me. Everybody thinks that that's their body and they're using it for their benefit rather than get, taking their body and surrendering their body to me and let me live in them and use it as my body. It's not my body. He bought and paid for us. He bought me with a price. He shed his blood. I don't belong to myself. You don't belong to yourself anymore. So why are we trying to get God to do what we're wanting him to do in my body? The Lord spoke to my spirit, and I shared this before. He said, that's the reason many Christians are sick, because they want me to heal their body, and they don't recognize I heal my body. And if they're mine, and I live in, in them, I am the healer of my body. While we at it, let's just go on with this. James chapter 5, I believe it is. He says, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. We got authority over him, you know. We've got authority over the devil. Brother, when the devil comes, just resist him. Command him to go. You got authority over him through the name of Jesus. Just tell him to go. Lay hands on that person. Command that sickness to leave them. And you got authority over sickness and disease. So make them, make them spirits go. Make that sickness go. We've all been guilty of that. That's only half true. See, we didn't read the first part of that verse. What is the first part of that verse? We know that part real well. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. But what's the first part of the verse? What? Submit yourself unto God. Then resist the devil and he'll flee from you. 
We don't have authority over the devil if the devil has got authority over us. We can resist him all we want to unless we're surrendered to God and we yielded to God. I can't stand up against the devil and tell him what to do and what not to do because he's controlling half of it. Well, I thought we had authority. We do. What did Jesus, what did the centurion say to Jesus when he came? He said, my daughter is nigh unto death even now. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But if you'll just speak the word only, my, what is it, servant, servant, not daughter, but my servant will be made whole. That ain't where he stopped. He didn't stop right there. What's the next verse? For I am a man also who is under authority. I say to this one, go, and that one to go. And I say to this one, come, and he comes. And you're the same way, Jesus. Whatever you say, go, it goes. Whatever you say, comes. But see, the key to that is I am also one likened unto you who is under authority. We don't have authority unless we're under authority. We need to quit telling people, going around telling nobody, you need to just resist the devil. You need to just rebuke that. I mean, you got authority over the devil, just go tell him to go. You don't have authority over the devil unless you're submitted unto God. It don't work any other way. I think we ought to praise the Lord because that's what God's Word says. Amen? No wonder we're rebuking and nothing happening. I bind you, devil. And the devil says, I bind you. I've already bound you. I resist you, devil. He said, yeah, I resist you. We have no authority except delegated authority. And God does not give us delegated authority unless we're submitted under authority. If we don't, it don't work. If we drink the cup of surrendering my will, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, it's you that I'm wanting to please. My meat, what I love to eat and live off of is to do the will of the Father that sent me. That's what Jesus is looking for. He's looking for people on the earth that is not so consumed with their own lives and want God to change them and bless them and do for them, but he's looking for people that will surrender themselves unto him and say, Lord, the reason I live is for your will to be done in my life. If you lose your life, you'll save it. Well, that means, Brother Ron, does that mean that we all both go quit our jobs move out of our house, start living under trees and lose our lives, start eating beanie weenies. Is that how you lose your life? He says, take up the cross and follow me. What is this cross that he's talking about? If you really, my disciples, first of all, deny yourself. Take up the cross, my cross, and follow me. And I'll give you authority. I'll give you dominion. What is this cross? It's when my will crosses his will, then I take the cross and cross out my will that his will may be accomplished. What are we afraid of? We're afraid to ask him what his will is because it might not be my will. What did Jesus say in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if it is possible for this, for this to pass from me, if it's possible, Lord, that this is your will, and I know this is the cup that you gave to me to drink, but if there's any other way, Lord, let it pass. But Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. You know the reason Jesus is second only to God Almighty right now is because he humbled himself and became a servant to the Father. He humbled himself that the Father used him to be a blessing to other people. He was not consumed with his own life. He was, had compassion on everybody else's lives. Talking about peace. Peace comes when we quit focusing on ourselves and start yielding up our life and start asking the Lord what he'd have me to do. 
Does that mean I quit my job? No. God wants to use you on your job. He don't want us to get in a room and seclude ourselves and become holier than thou. The monks had already tried that. And it didn't work for them. I mean, how righteous and holy can you be? I mean, if you don't read a newspaper, you don't watch television, you don't do anything, you just sit around meditating and singing psalms and hymns, that's good for you, but it don't help the world. I'm not against any religion. Religion's just bondage. I don't care where it comes. But the truth of the matter is what God is wanting us to do and what he's wanting us, he wants us in the world. Did we not know that we're the salt of the earth? Do we not know that the Lord Jesus Christ that lives in me is wanting to use my body to talk to people or to minister to them or share my testimony? Well, I can't preach, Brother Ron. I can't sing. But you know what? If God's ever done something in your life, you can witness for him. Rather than grumbling and murmuring and complaining about life when other people are going through hell on earth and we say, oh, yeah, I remember that. I, you know, this, that, and other. No, it's time for a testimony. It's time to let them know God has brought me through things before. I don't know how to preach. I may not know how to quote scripture. But one thing every one of